Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the second Culture Journey Community Assembly. My name is Sonia Jacobs. I'm the Chief Organizational Learning Officer for the University in UHR, Senior Director of Faculty and Leadership Development at Michigan Medicine, and Special Advisor to the President on Culture. I'm pleased to be with you today alongside several partners and champions of our culture change effort, who you'll be hearing from later in our agenda. Our culture journey begins with the establishment of unifying shared values, the first step in a larger effort to build a culture that fosters trust and provides a strong foundation to live up to our highest ideals. Why values? Because values inform the behaviors and norms that we expect to see. They guide our choices and should be reflected in everything we do. From how we hire and promote make decisions, educate and conduct research, and treat one another. Values should reflect who we are and what we stand for. The unifying shared values are the foundation to our culture and can help us build one where everyone can thrive. Since our Culture Change Community Assembly in May, we've begun to implement the first recommendation put forth by the Values Identification Working Group, which was to continue engaging with our community to narrow down the list of values and begin to define them. We look forward to sharing more about what we've learned, the process we've engaged in, and answering your questions. Before I introduce our first speaker, I wanna invite you to use the Q&A function throughout our session today to submit a question. Though time prevents us from answering every question live, we will be reviewing them all to be answered on the FAQ page on our website, culturejourney.umich.edu. With that, I am honored to introduce President Mary Sue Coleman to deliver remarks. President Coleman. Good afternoon. I wanna thank Sonia Jacobs and Patricia Hearn for leading this critical initiative and in hosting today's assembly. Since returning in January as president, I have made it a priority to help restore trust and faith in U of M. This past year has been unlike any other in campus history. And I appreciate the support I have received from so many on campus. I know that change and transitions can be hard. I want to thank Sonia for her wise counsel on the ways to make the university more inclusive, compassionate, and equitable. I will step down as president on October 13th, two weeks from tomorrow. I want to assure you, though, that our 15th president, Dr. Santa Ono, is aware of your work and its value to the university. The commitment to culture change is a university priority and one that he will embrace and promote. It's equally important to reinforce that we all have an obligation to uphold our values <clears throat> as a place of learning, teaching, working, and healing. This was so apparent to me as the regents conducted their search for a new president. When they asked for input, from the community, there was this overwhelming response. Integrity matters. It was a profound and reassuring reflection on our faculty, staff, and students that so many came forward to say this. They told me and the regents that this is a community with high standards and high expectations. Shared values of integrity, compassion, respect, accountability, these give us a roadmap as a major institution. I believe that our moral compass is true, but we cannot be complacent about voicing and upholding our shared values. I know we've all been hurt by the episodes of sexual and gender-based misconduct of recent years. It's been traumatic for many people, but I'm proud of how we have responded and how we continue to respond. We can't underestimate the amount of work that has been done in this area. We're going through all levels of the institution and are being very explicit 
about where we failed and where to put policies in place to uncover potential problems more quickly. We need to be more nimble and we're getting there. In particular, I am pleased that we now have the CCRT, the Coordinated Community Response Team. This is a collaborative group of 30 people charged with discussing misconduct issues and providing input from different perspectives. The CCRT is another important step toward our vision of becoming a national leader in protecting our community from inappropriate behavior and sexual misconduct. I've repeatedly said that I want Michigan to be at the forefront of making college campuses safer, welcoming, and responsive. We will never be perfect, but we must never relax our efforts to create a culture that is safe and respectful. We can't say, okay, we fixed this. That was one of our problems in the past. We've said we fixed it, but we didn't have any mechanisms in place to continue the conversation. We must keep focusing on this. That's why today's assembly and the overall work of culture change is critical. We must hold each other accountable, lift each other up, always. We all have an obligation to do this at all levels of the university. If we don't, we are not a true community. I appreciate your dedication, patience, and optimism. By taking part in this culture journey, you're contributing to our understanding of what is needed to make U of M a place where all people feel safe and can thrive. You should feel very good knowing that you're making a difference. Thank you. Thank you, President Coleman. I will now welcome Provost McCauley. Good afternoon and thank you, President Coleman. And welcome to everyone. I'm very pleased to join you as we continue our work on this important topic together. First, I too would like to thank Sonia Jacobs, Patty Hearn, and the extraordinary team of dedicated faculty and staff for your work on this vital topic. We are at a pivotal point, a moment of leadership transition and renewed commitment to all that makes Michigan great. Before I address the work at hand, I want to take a moment to publicly thank President Coleman for her commitment to this effort and her visible steadfast leadership. She returned to lead the university at a critical time and pushed us forward in this work of reasserting and reclaiming the university's culture and values. Her genuine care and compassion for our community is evident in all she does whether she's leading our board, engaging major conversations and events on campus, or simply baking cookies to share with the staff in her office. Thank you, President Coleman. You are an inspiration to all of us. For those of you who joined us at the last community assembly in May, you may remember that it took place on my very first day as provost. It seems like a long time ago now, uh, four and a half months later, we're now looking forward to welcoming President-elect Ono to campus next month. I've been fortunate to have met with him several times. I'm impressed with his knowledge of academic affairs, his keen memory for details, his appreciation of the arts, and his sincere interest in people. He's eager to join us in two weeks. He's already been to the big house for a football game. And if you're on social media, you can't help but be drawn in by his enthusiasm. In a few minutes, you will hear in detail about the work that has taken place since we last convened. I've been impressed by the substantive engagement by so many members of the U of M community in the work of articulating our shared values. 
I also appreciate the tough questions our community is raising to help us ensure that this work is both tangible and impactful in our daily work lives. And as President Coleman mentioned, the creation and implementation of coordinated community response team marks a significant step forward. This group drawn from across our campuses will advise the university on a wide range of approaches to prevent and address misconduct. As I prepared for today's conversation, I was reminded that we are not creating a culture for the university. Of course, every business organization, university group has a culture and values. Whether we are new to the university or re-examining it with fresh eyes, we must ask ourselves important questions about our culture and values. Is it welcoming and inclusive? Is it supportive and encouraging? Is it transparent and collaborative? The important work of the culture change journey is at its core an effort to re-articulate and then recommit to the values we hold dear. The fact that so many people throughout the University of Michigan are deeply troubled when they learn of bad behavior by people who are part of our university is evidence of a shared culture that rejects such misconduct. Our effort to clarify and articulate exactly what our values and culture are is not a correction to our values. Rather, it's a reevaluation, a re-emphasis of what we believe in. We are rededicating ourselves as a community to leading with those values, to be in a place where faculty, staff, and students hold themselves and each other accountable for comporting themselves in accordance with those shared values. When various groups, faculty, staff, members of units met in focus groups and listened, their priorities were remarkably in sync with each other with regard to the values like integrity, respect, inclusion, diversity, collaboration, and the relative importance of each one. Personally, I find this coalescence very reassuring. I'm heartened by the questions being raised about how we will implement what we're learning. For example, how will we ensure that we hire people who share our values? How do we make sure our work and learning environments are constructive? How will we help those in leadership positions support our values and culture and reinforce them? These and similar questions form an important foundation for the next phases of this work. In the provost's office, we are in the early stages of an initiative to work with campus deans to explore what we can collectively do to reinforce positive work climates throughout the university. We are at a unique moment, one of shared commitment to coming together, stating our values explicitly, and working together to ensure we live those values day in and day out, no matter what our role is in the university. Thank you for your dedication. The culture journey is off to a great beginning. Thank you for being part of it. And back to you, Sonia. Thank you very much, Provost McCauley, for your continued support and leadership. And President Coleman, for your graciousness, calming demeanor, and unwavering support. I've been honored to serve under your leadership. Before we share with you what we've learned since our last update in May, I wanna take a moment to reflect on where we've been. Many individuals, groups, teams, units, and departments throughout our university have been working tirelessly toward culture change. The charge to identify our workplace values was formally launched as a presidential initiative last summer. 
Our scope focused specifically on faculty, staff, and student employees on our Ann Arbor campus, including Michigan Medicine. As we shared in our last community assembly in May, we started first with collecting what values currently exist within our schools, colleges, and units. Through feedback from stakeholder groups, a university-wide poll, and focus groups with faculty and staff, we further deepened our understanding of our community's thoughts and their experiences of our culture. After qualitative and quantitative analysis of our data, we presented our findings to our executive officers in June, along with recommendations for future work. These findings showed our top values in consideration to be collaboration, community, diversity, equity, excellence, inclusion, innovation, integrity, respect, service, and transparency. Since then, we launched our second Pulse Poll that closed earlier this month, carried out nine additional focus groups of faculty and staff, and convened an ad hoc advisory committee of stakeholders to further define our values. This fall, we will continue to gather input from our stakeholders to determine a common definition for our values before presenting values and definitions to our executive officers. Now, here to share with you our preliminary findings, I'd like to invite my colleague, Carmetta Stokes, Strategic Initiatives Consultant in Organizational Learning, to share what we've learned from our most recent community engagement efforts. Carmetta. Thank you, Sonia. So as mentioned, this summer we engaged the campus community in more in-depth conversations about the values under consideration for institution-wide adoption. This past August, we launched a poll to all faculty and staff on the Ann Arbor campus and Michigan Medicine. In this first slide, we have a breakdown of who responded to the poll and the number of respondents that were received. So we can have that slide added, thank you. So we had a little over uh, 3,000 in total. In our next slide, we group respondents by primary affiliation. So we had almost double the number of respondents uh, from the Ann Arbor campus than Michigan Medicine. There were three primary questions that we asked in the poll. Here on the next slide, we have the responses to the first question of whether diversity, equity, and inclusion should be combined as one value for U of M or stand as three separate values. 52% of respondents indicated that DE&I should be combined as one value, and approximately 42% of respondents indicated that DEI should be listed as separate values. An additional 6% of respondents chose other. In our next slide, um, we asked the question of whether or not excellence should be considered as an outcome, so a standard of behavior, or as a value, a consequence of behavior. Almost 61% of respondents indicated that excellence should be considered as an outcome versus 39% who indicated excellence should be considered as a value. The third question posed was an open-ended question. We asked if we had shared institutional values to which every faculty and staff member was held accountable, what would accountability look like? We received over 1,700 responses to this question. And the list here represents the preliminary themes that emerged based on analysis conducted by ISR. So these included, there is accountability at the leadership level. So leaders are held accountable for their actions and problematic behaviors are not allowed to persist based on individual's title or position of power. The same standards and expectations for behavior apply to everyone. So people are held accountable to the same standards and individuals are treated the same regardless of their position, title, rank, or status. There are consequences for individuals who act in ways contrary to institutional values. So suggestions for actionable consequences ranged from restorative justice opportunities that are not punitive in nature to termination of employment. The organization follows through on its express goals and commitments, 
So basically doing what we say we're going to do, keeping track of our commitments related to the values and challenging ourselves and others to follow through on these commitments. Um, there is transparency for decisions as well as ownership when mistakes are made. So examples included being transparent about the outcome for those impacted by decisions, apologizing and listening when mistakes happen, articulating what steps will be taken to correct an issue, and establishing an action plan to move forward. Values are integrated into performance reviews at all levels. So expectations regarding values are an established part of the performance evaluation process and feedback is provided to leaders, faculty, and staff at all levels. And finally, there is a clear process for reporting concerns about fear or retaliation without fear or retaliation and that there is follow-up concerning reports that have been made. Now, in addition to the poll that we conducted, um, we conducted nine focus groups over the summer to engage in deeper conversations about the values and their definitions. Six of those focus groups were composed of staff from the HR community, DEI leads, and M Healthy Champions. And three focus groups were composed of faculty members who responded to an email from their dean and the provost. Each focus group was assigned two values to discuss and provide their feedback and recommendations for modifications to the drafted definitions that were provided. Focus group participants were also asked to respond to two primary questions related to adoption and socialization of those values. The first question posed asked participants to share what concerns they might have with adoption of institution-wide values and definitions once they have been finalized. As indicated on this slide, both faculty and staff emphasized that leadership commitment and, and accountability is essential for success. So for instance, leaders modeling the values, addressing the account accountability and retaliation and investing time and resources. Both groups also stated that effective socialization and integration strategies are needed to support U of M community buy-in. So ensuring that there is common understanding of the values, acknowledging espoused values versus lived values, and also addressing change fatigue. Both groups also suggested that a measurement um, an assessment plan is needed to address questions concerning how we might monitor and evaluate our efforts over time. Additionally, the importance of having opportunities to learn and have conversations about what the values mean for the individual, the team, the unit, and how we might integrate them into our everyday work came up in the staff focus group. Additionally, faculty strongly advise that values identification should not be a university's rebranding effort, but instead be an earnest effort to fundamentally improve our culture. On the next slide, um, focus groups were asked to provide recommendations on how to best communicate institution-wide values and definitions to the campus community. As you can see, both faculty and staff suggested that utilizing a broad communication and engagement plan was needed, such as communicating via forums, town halls, video, using video campaigns and social media in addition to email. Suggestions also included implementing a phased themed rollout approach, along with providing discussion toolkits and materials to units. Staff and faculty also noted the importance of having leadership actively engage in this effort. So examples might be communications from leaders on why this initiative is important to them, what action steps they will take to model the values, and how accountability will be addressed at the top. Additionally, faculty noted the importance of faculty engagement in this effort. Suggested ways to participate included discussion of values with other faculty members and their deans and the development of action steps to operationalize the values. What I've just shared is, high, is a high level snapshot of what we have learned thus far from the campus poll and focus groups. More in-depth qualitative analysis is underway and we look forward to sharing more details in future communications. 
So with that being said, Sonia, I am handing the mic back to you to, to kick off our Q&A portion of the session. Great. Thank you so very much, uh, Carmetta. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our panelists for the Q&A section of our time together today. President Mary Sue Coleman is joining us again, as is Provost Lori McCauley. And I'd like to introduce Rich Holcomb, Associate Vice President for Human Resources, Tabby Chavez, Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer in the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and Katrina Way Golden, Associate Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion and Deputy Chief Diversity Officer in the Office of Dur Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Thank you all for being here today. When we invited our community to this event, we asked for questions to be submitted for our panelists to address. We will also leave some time for questions submitted live. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A. Even if we don't get to it today, we want to hear from you to inform our FAQs on our website. So the first question is for President Coleman. What is the top priority for the university as an institution to restore trust within the university community? And how are we going about achieving it? Well, Sonia, you and I have talked about this uh, quite a bit. And it's just going to be a process. And I think by our deeds, by our willingness to set up the CCRT, which will be a way to bring people together to coordinate what they're hearing on campus, their concerns. Um, and I think for us, uh, having these sessions, I mean, you know, a, it, it's really important that we not just say, okay, we've set up this committee, it's going to take care of all the problems, you know, and wash our hands of it. I, no, we can't do this. It will take time. Culture ta change takes time. Uh, giving people the confidence that they can come forward and that, you know, we'll investigate. You know, sometimes the concerns will be validated, sometimes they won't be validated. But I think having a process and being open about it and making sure that we invite people uh, to bring forward their issues, uh, that's the way ultimately when we can look back in a few years and say, you know, we really did change things here at the University of Michigan. It, we're, we're not thinking that somehow we're gonna stop all the concerns <laughs> or we're too big a community to do that. Uh, but I think the effort in involving so many people is really a, a very, very important next step that we're taking. Thank you very much, President Coleman. And the common theme I'm hearing there is inclusion. So I'm going to uh, pose this next question to Provost McCauley. We say we want to create a culture that promotes a sense of belonging and inclusion. Across the university, there is a prevalent experience that faculty, especially tenured full professors, are treated differently than staff and students. How can we promote a more equitable and inclusive culture? Well, I can say unequivocally that each and every member of our university community plays an important role on our campus. We're all humans and we all deserve to be treated with respect, irrespective of our title. I can attest that campus leaders, executive officers and deans speak passionately about their support for all in our community. If there are pockets or individuals who don't display such respect, they should be kindly reminded of our values and providing an opportunity to engage in a respectful manner. I, I think about a program at Michigan Medicine that has a, a early intervention approach where when there are compromises of interactions, say between a faculty and staff or a faculty and a patient, um, there's a, a kind 
conversation with that individual and it being uh, operative really early on um, has shown to be really effective. In those instances that aren't effective with uh, an early intervention, then they should be escalated and, um, and dealt with at that point. But I think one of the keys is us all understanding and, and agreeing on the values and then looking at approaches for early intervention, um, which have been shown to be very effective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rich, this next question is coming your way. With COVID, we've seen flexibility and work allow for remote and hybrid arrangements to better support employees. What does the university's commitment to flexibility look like? And how can we ensure equity in the future of work at Michigan? Well, thank you, Sonia, for that question. A really important topic. And, you know, I, I want to first say that I think our campus community has showed tremendous resili resiliency uh, over the past number of years and adapting to our situation and our environment while still trying to serve our missions. Really important. Most campus units have really worked hard, I think, to balance uh, the operational needs uh, with the employee preferences. Making adjustments uh, in response to the pandemic, I think, have become relatively common practice, new and different types of schedules, alternative schedules, hybrid work arrangements. Uh, we've also learned over the past couple of years that there's both positive and negative uh, experiences uh, of working on site or working remotely. I think our collective you know, challenge is continuing to balance flexibility in ways that ensure our missions while remaining um, you know, a, a, as a top priority that we create a positive and engaging workplace. Workplace flexibility, I really think, uh, has many different meetings, uh, meanings uh, in different operations. Uh, not all jobs you know, really lend themselves to the same forms of flexibility like remote work. But I think an important element, and that as we've discussed with leadership, is flexibility is an important uh, element for our campus community and that we need to embrace that. I believe that decisions uh, must continue to be made locally by the leadership of each school, college, and unit. Uh, the university is really committed to supporting different modes of work uh, that units recommend for their operations and to support their missions. Uh, it, in the spring, President Coleman uh, announced the formation of a future work steering group. Uh, that committee is now meeting and that we plan to make recommendations by the end of the calendar year. And with that committee, what we're looking at are policies, practices, uh, tools that can support the various forms of work and levels of flexibility uh, for the units uh, to adopt. Uh, and we need to be creative. Uh, in how we define flexibility. Again, as I said, some jobs may not be able to be done remotely, but we can encourage flexibility in different ways, flexible schedules, four 10 hour days, alternative start stop times, uh, other forms of flexibility could apply. Our university is really too big and comprehensive and complex to apply a single approach across the entire organization. So we wanna really embrace a strategy of principles that guide us uh, for how we can think about supporting flexibility to meet our missions across our campus community. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and pose a question to either Tabby or Katrina, or you may both want to respond uh, to this question. Many in the BIPOC community are exhausted in the continued fight for equity and culture change. What steps are being taken to create a fair and equitable culture for all students, faculty, and staff? I'll jump in. Um, afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to join this panel um, around these you know, really important issues um, and um, this partnership with the Values uh, Change Journey. Um, I hear two questions when I hear that statement and one of them or two kind of issues. One of them is that um, DEI issues or equity and fairness um, and the fight for it is, is often viewed as only the work of certain communities. <laughs> so it's disproportionately on the backs of those from our minoritized communities. And then I also hear that the work 
um, is in, often done on um, um, inequitably um, on top of one's regular work um, in ways that are invisible, unrecognized, and unrewarded. And so, one of the things that um, you know is exciting about the DEI strategic planning process that, that we've been engaged in is that it is exactly about culture change around DEI. That is. Um, Chain, moving away from DEI being the re relegated to the responsibility of particular communities and particular spaces to it being standard operating practice across our units and across our institution. And what that means then is that the work of DEI becomes distributed. <laughs> It's not just relegated to particular communities. It becomes the responsibility of each and every one of our units. Um, the rewards and the resources um, that units ask for and have access to become attached to their um, work and goals and progress and efforts related to DEI, um, that they're bringing in new voices and new perspectives versus the, those that have only been the ones who've been the warriors on the ground all the time. And uh, you know, structures like our DEI leads, for instance, create opportunities for effort, you know, credited positions for people to work on these things in ways that also um, are attached to visibility and recognition so that these roles are not just the roles that people do on the side, but that the roles become integrated into their actual um, work responsibilities and titles and kind of the credit that they get for those things too. I mean, the work also becomes more strategic because they're part of a broader community where the work is not just relegated to individuals who are trying to figure it out on their own, but we're providing a, a structure to support strategic planning and engagement also in conversation with their unit leaders so that they're not doing the work on their own, that we're a part of the accountability structure to support um, you know, uptake of these issues. So I'll say that that is an important kind of part of the culture change agenda. Um, and we have indicators, we've just shared some information yesterday in our climate survey session that our community is seeing progress in those spaces. But you know, my favorite saying these days is two things can be true at the same time. Um, and like we also see that people are still continuing to name um, the fact that we are still uneven on across our campus um, around the ways that you know inclusion related to you know uh, opportunities for advancement for our you know staff and our faculty um, for our hiring and our admissions that are happening not evenly across the campus. So I think that um, we are seeing progress because our strategy is naming the work as essential work, not just siloed work and also name and also providing structures to recognize and reward the work both at the individual level but also at the unit level and we think these things you know as we continue forward um, on this path will make a difference and also relieve the burden that's been disproportionately carried by so many great thank you tabby katrina well said i don't have anything uh, unique to add to that Okay, then I have another question to pose to you, if that's okay, Katrina. A uh, part of culture change is building a sense of belonging. What is the university doing to create that sense of belonging for all community members, especially those, as Tabby has stated, uh, from marginalized identities? So I think this question draws or... Um you know, uh, dovetails nicely with the question that was posed to uh, Provost Macaulay, actually. It was around belongingness. And so I'll take a slightly different uh, vantage point to the answer here. And what I'd like to lean on is really the efforts um, of our planning initiative, and particularly as we turn our time and attention towards planning for DI 2.0. So, um, you know, as Tabby suggested, a critical component of our DI effort is this climate survey effort. And uh, one, first I would offer that one of the things that we're currently doing is delving into the data around our, um, a set of questions we asked about perceptions of being valued and belonging. And so that will be really helpful and instructive to identify the spaces um, where folks are feeling this sense of belongingness, um, gaps, you know, when they are not feeling that, and just to understand 
what that looks like across our various constituencies for our faculty, staff, and students. So I just wanted to point that out to let the community know that the, those set of analyses are underway. And we are uniquely positioned because of our DI effort and our, our focus on having that complementary data in the climate survey, um, uniquely positioned and standing apart from other institutions and being able to speak directly to that. So more will come there. But then I wanna center a couple of comments on how we expand to, or how we plan to expand our commitment around addressing this issue in our plans. So both at the central level, as well as our unit-based plans for DI 2.0. So across all of the 50 units, as well as the central plan, we are um, requiring that each unit speak to what we are calling vital strategies. And there are six vital strategies because they're critically, critically important. So one is that each plan should be speaking to, and I'll just briefly list them, how the unit plans to take up recruitment issues so that we are ensuring that our community, student, faculty, and staff are, um, that that is diverse, how are we addressing hiring and selection um, in our local spaces? What opportunities do we have around career advancement? So really being explicit at a unit level of uh, speaking to those things. And those, are, those three right there are important in and of themselves. But I would highlight three additional ones, which I think provide the unit the opportunity to go to the heart of this issue of belongingness, right? So the fourth element is DEI skill building. And that is each unit calling out in detail by virtue of strategic objectives and associated action items, what they will do in DI 2.0 to build the skill of those individuals in their units. Because the way in which we engage with one another and the more skillful that is, creates the foundation for how we build this robust um, culture that we all aspire to. So DI skill building and making sure that we're ensuring that across the various constituencies will be critically important. But then the fifth vital strategy is, what are you doing in the unit space to cultivate and create climate enhancing activities? So what types of activities are you planning for, calling out, and being really responsive to what your community is calling for um, to make sure that we have activities that uh, enhance our climate. And then six, what explicit pathways for conflict resolution will your unit attend to in your plan? So I think those three things, and, and more holistically, the six vital strategies that we're requiring all units to speak to will really build forward or, or help to build this sense of belongingness that we, we all hope for as we traverse over into our DI 2.0 efforts. Thank you, Katrina. One of the things that I am hearing in you all's comments relate to the processes and, and more specifically, how are we integrating these uh, values and behaviors into what we do every day? And so one of the questions I have for President Coleman uh, speaks to what we've been hearing from our community related to accountability. What are the plans to ensure that members of the university community are held accountable to uphold institutional values once they've been adopted? And how will leaders in particular be accountable or held accountable to those values? You know, well, one of the things that's been so interesting for me, uh, I think I come back to the university with a little bit different perspective because I was away for two years, I mean, for two years, I was away for eight years. Uh, and in the, in the meantime, you know, I had had the opportunity to go to Washington and be head of the Association of American Universities. And so it gave me a broader perspective about what is happening across the country at institutions like the University of Michigan, both public and private. And you know, I have to say to people, I was so impressed when I got back and I realized that you had this DEI 1.0. You had gone through that. This is hard work. This is tough work. Not only did you do that, then you went on and you've planning for DEI 
2.0, but you're, you're still doing a strategic planning process to get make sure that you get that right. And that's going to give us the opportunity to make sure that all of our policies throughout the institution have DEI in mind. That, that's what I like so much about what, what Tabby has been saying, that two things can be true at the same time. We, we, you know, we're working on the policies and, and what Rich said about the hiring policies and what Lori said about how do we look, how do we get that through the academic enterprise. I think the way that we ultimately will be successful and hold ourselves accountable is to continue on this fabulous path that the university has started. I will tell you, when I look across the country, I think it's taken a lot of courage for the institution and a lot, and you all in the institution, there's not, not some separate institution that have dedicated to this and we're keeping doing the work. This is hard work. I don't know of anybody else in the country that has had this kind of sustained effort. And Sonia and I have talked about this many times that sustained effort, sustained progress, continuing to make the commitment. Will we make mistakes? Yes. Will we, we might get it wrong, but we're willing to go back and look at that again. And so I, I am, I have to tell you, I feel so uh, optimistic about our ability to get there and that our willingness to say, you know, when we make mistakes, we will hold ourselves accountable. We will hold our leaders accountable. I know our provost is totally committed on the academic side. I know that our executive VPs are committed. Uh, it's interesting to me even to listen to the conversations around the table for the executive officers and how much that group is just jumping in, willing to collaborate with each other. I mean, in almost every incident, we find that it's not, we're not just siloed. It's not just one, uh, you know, Tabby, I think you would agree with me on that when we've talked about some issues that have come up that it will affect many, many different parts of the university. And we have to make sure that we're continuing the collaboration uh, at our level, but then at every level that we have a mechanism to sort of make sure that everybody's paying attention. And, and, and I do think it's happening, not perfect, but I think it's happening. Thank you very much, President Coleman. I have two additional questions that I want to pose, and one continues the theme around accountability to Provost Macaulay. And it speaks to how will all faculty members be held accountable to the values, especially as we mentioned our tenured uh, faculty and our faculty leaders? Thank you, Sonia. Um, I'll, I'll share that um, I've been actively involved when I was a dean um, for two years in a subcommittee of deans that were looking at just this topic and um, uh, the professional standards and how we can uphold them in our communities and how we can assure that our faculty are upholding them. Uh, I actually chaired this committee in its first year and in the last year, Dave Gear, the Dean of SMTD chaired it. And uh, his group came forward with recommendations and it was just really timely because as I was moving into the provost role, then I could take these recommendations and we're actually starting to move through them to, to make progress on this. And I'll just give you a couple examples. And one is, uh, doing a review of the standard practice guide, which deals with professional standards and making sure that it's contemporary, making sure that it fits with our values, as well as looking at best practices for how we can take into consideration a candidate's track record in professional standards uh, during hiring. Uh, we, we're also spending a fair amount uh, of effort in training our leaders, our campus chairs and deans, continually reinforcing to them their roles, their responsibilities in this regard, and also providing them with toolkits of how they can, they can uh, really deliver on uh, this goal. We do that through leadership events on our campus and continually best practices, sharing them across and actually giving them case scenarios to work through so that they can really put themselves into 
positions and be able to see uh, how they would think about different scenarios. Um, I mentioned before a subset of campus deans that are now focusing on establishing positive climates and how they can, as leaders, establish positive climates because we are committed that if we can really focus on establishing positive climates, that will diminish some of the negative or um, uh, behaviors that uh, we're trying to combat. And as President Coleman said, you know, this is not easy work and we're not perfect. And I think we need to give ourselves some grace during those times, but pick right back up and, um, and, and keep our focus and our determination to what we really believe in, which is following the values that our community um, is getting behind. Great. Thank you very much, Provost McCauley. I've got one more pre-submitted questions and then we're gonna open it up to uh, live questions. This last pre-submitted question is to you, Rich. What is the university doing to eliminate bias in hiring and diversify our workforce? Thank you, Sonia. And when, when Katrina was talking earlier, I was really, you know, re resonating with the statements that she was describing and how important this is. And so with our talent acquisition team in university HR, the focus really is around skill bills, skill bill uh, based training and hiring uh, really to help implement those practices. And a goal really of, of our efforts is to really diversify our applicant pools. Uh, we look at our sourcing, um, how we're advertising, how we're promoting jobs. Are we promoting jobs broadly in different professional networks and groups, uh, publications outside of the university that can really help strengthen uh, the diversity of our applicant pools. Uh, furthermore, we, we have tools already internally that we can use uh, to assist us, such as Data People, which is an online tool uh, that reviews job postings to make sure that the language is more candidate friendly and inclusive. Uh, it helps to increase the diversity of our applicant pools. And everyone has access to this tool uh, today. Uh, I really think it's important to consider, again, the skills focused recruiting effort uh, and, and data informed decision making to lessen the impact of bias in the hiring process. Uh, you know, ensuring that we are training on anti-bias to neutralize in the hiring process. And when we are in the process of hiring, uh, ensuring that teams are either trained in anti-bias or that, that at least one member of the team has that training. Uh, so that as we're going through the process uh, of interviewing candidates, whether they're internal or external to the university, Somebody who's willing to then speak up and interrupt if they see bias in that process, I think is a really important aspect. Uh, so it's really about utilizing the tools, the resources, and really focusing on the skills and ensuring we have a good networking and sourcing strategies to help support the diversity of our pools. Great. Thank you, Rich. Um, a couple of the questions that we have received um, live speak to accessibility. So Tabby, I'm gonna ask that you uh, respond uh, to this question. What is the university doing to support disability or to support a disability culture on campus? As a student with disabilities, I feel there isn't much priority towards supporting the disabled community beyond just compliance. Thank you for the question. I saw that one in the chat early on um, and was hoping we would be able to get to it. Um, quickly, I will say uh, that disability culture is, a, is, to me, a critical part of our work of DEI and culture change more broadly and must be centered as a part of our 2.0 um, agenda. Um, I will say, I mean, just in sharing data, uh, that uh, concerns around climate and advocacy for, from dis, for members of our disability community came through in our 2021 survey in ways that did not emerge in our 2016 uh, in the beginning of our DEI planning process. So what that means across students, faculty, and staff. And to me, what that meant is that 
the awareness and um, the empowerment of this community to raise concerns um, has certainly been impacted in positive ways over this over the last years. We have some terrific programming um, that's not only focused on compliance, but on building community and supporting community through our Office of Student Life, um, including leadership by a student idea board who has come up with a number of terrific ideas, some of which have been instituted and implemented or in the process thereof. And so we look forward to sharing that information. About, um, I will also say, you know, in terms of the two things can be true mantra um, is that even though I've only been in my current role since August, I've already met with five different disability groups, um, focused groups on our campus in different unit spaces. And some of them didn't know each other. And so one is that this community is quite diverse in itself, different ways of thinking and different ways of organizing and different priority spaces that they wanna work on. But, they, but the loveliness of our decentralization sometimes can inhibit like this broader collective power to come together. So I definitely see that as part of my role is to support the connection across these different communities, not to um, dictate their agenda, but to bring them in community to one another, um, to share perspectives, which could be different and similar, but to also to create greater collective capacity along with partnerships with student life and in our schools and colleges and other unit spaces that um, are working on these areas, um, often in ways that may not be so visible to our students. Thank you so very much, Tabby. And I'd like to also thank all of our panelists for your support and insight and to everyone that's joined us uh, for the assembly today. Uh, we are at time, but I do wanna also thank those who pre-submitted questions that were very important and thoughtful and those of you that have shared questions via the Q&A. Uh, as you can see, we're unable to get to every question today, but please check our Culture Journey website for ongoing updates, as well as answers to the questions on our FAQ page. As we close, I'd like to thank those who have made your voice heard throughout this process, responding to our Pulse polls, engaging in focus groups, and ad hoc committees, as well as joining us today. We look forward to sharing these results with President-elect Ono once he has officially assumed the role as president next month. In my conversations with him about this work, his commitment is very, very clear to culture change. We look forward to continuing our journey to identify unifying shared values to guide how we create a workplace culture where all can thrive. The slides covered today, as well as the responses to the FAQs will be posted on the website again at culturejourney.umich.edu. Thank you all and have a great day.